Howdy, howdy. This is Mr. Potter. In our last episode, we introduced the C++ programming language. We talked primarily about how to create a program using the int main as our main method instead of the public static void main that we're familiar with in Java, and also how to set up output using the IO stream and the console output or cout command. What we're going to talk about in today's lesson is we're going to talk about how to deal with input as well as what different types of primitives we have access to in Java, I mean in C++. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new file and I'm going to go ahead and save this file. I'm going to call it primitive.cpp and I'm going to set it up. So I have my include IO stream and then using namespace std and int main and we're going to go ahead and return zero. Now, one of the things that's nice about this is that it's going to try and autocomplete for me. If I'm typing in return, I just hit enter and it will autocomplete whatever is selected. Just be careful with it because it sometimes will give me things I don't want. So namespace would be helpful. So what I need to do is I want to talk about declaring variables. And declaring variables is exactly the same way we declared variables in Java. So if I wanted to declare a variable of type int, I would do int num gets 0, or I could say int num gets 44, or I could just say int num if I don't want to initialize it at this point. So I'm going to declare it by doing type and then variable name, and then I can do an assignment immediately afterwards. What's going to be different about this is how we deal with input. You may remember that when we were dealing with input in Java, we had to come up with a scanner and there was a lot of stuff that we had to do. Input in C++ is much more straightforward with the IO stream and using the namespace standard. What I'm going to do is I'm going to prompt the user for something. So C out and I want to tell them I'm looking for an integer. And then to get input from the user, I want to use a console input in the same vein that I'm using console output. And the command for console input is cn. And instead of directing stuff towards the console stream, I want to get stuff from the console stream. So instead of using these insertion operators, I actually want to use some extraction operators. And I want to take whatever the user types and store it into the variable num. So again, C out and C in, these aren't methods, these aren't functions. I'm not going to have parentheses and I'm not going to have parameters. What I'm going to have instead is directed flow to the console and directed flow from the console. So C out integer and C in num. And now what I want to do is I want to see what I've got. So I'm going to show the user what we've got. So C out and I'm going to print out num and then get a blank line. And then I'm going to take num and I'm going to plus plus it. So that should increment it by one. And then I'll go ahead and see out num again. So what this should do is it should prompt me for an integer. I'm going to type in an integer. It's going to print the integer and then print its successor. So I'm going to go ahead and save this file. I can do control S to save or I can do file save. Either way it works. And then I want to compile this. Remember that we're using the GNU G++ compiler to run these programs. And my program is called primitive.cpp. And I want to direct the output to primitive.exe. So now I've got this G++ program written. So I'm going to do dot slash primitive.exe to run this. And it's going to prompt me for an integer. So if I type in an integer like 72, it's going to print 72 and then print the successor of 72, which is 73. Now I've done this program for a very specific reason, and the reason is because I want to deal with the ranges of the numbers we're going to talk about. In Java, we only dealt with ints as our basic integer type, our whole number type. And so we're going to talk about a lot more different types of variables in this lesson. An int in C++ is just like an int in Java. It's a 16-bit or a 2-byte memory location. So if I wanted to run this program again, which, by the way, if I hit the up arrow, it's going to go up in the history and do the previous thing I just did. I'm going to call on primitive again, and on this time I'm going to type in 2,147,483,000. 
647. And you'll notice when I hit enter, the successor to 2,147, this max int. If I increment it by one more, I get this odometer effect. I end up going completely around in the bits, and I go back to minint, or the lowest possible integer, the negative 2,147,483,648. And remember that my minint value is one more than my maxint value because I have 2 to the 16th numbers. I have 4,294,000,000 numbers. Half of those are supposed to be positive, half of those are supposed to be even, one of those is supposed to be zero. So since I can't take an even number, take one away for zero, and then split it exactly in half, we give the extra number to the negative side. So our int range is exactly the same. But keep in mind that we're interested in how we're dealing with memory. So sometimes I may not need numbers that go up to the two billions or down to the two billions. Maybe I need a smaller number. And so instead of int, we have something called short. Now int is a two byte or a 16 bit value. Short is actually a one byte or an eight bit value. And so if I go ahead and save this file, I'm gonna hit up twice to access the history two steps back, in other words, my compiler, allow me to recompile quickly, and then hit up twice again to hit primitive.exe. Now I'm not prompting for an integer, I'm actually prompting for a short. So if I type in 32,767, that is my max short. And incrementing it by one does the odometer effect and gets me to my min short, which is negative 32,768. And that's because 2 to the 16th power is 65,536. So I've got this short, which has a much smaller range. And you're probably guessing that, well, if I want something that's much bigger than an int, then I want to use something called a long. And so if I make this a long type, and I'll save this, compile it, and run it. Now I've got a lot bigger numbers to deal with here. I can actually do uh, 9 quintillion, 223 quadrillion, 372 trillion, 36 billion, 854 million, 775,807. And when I type that in, I mean, I have a large number here. This is really 2 to the 63rd power minus 1 that I just typed in because this is a 64-bit or a 4-byte data value. So if, if you need numbers in the quintillions, I highly suggest the long. If you need numbers that are a little bit shorter than that, well, short would work. But there's something else that I'd like to talk about. The idea is that, you know, maybe I want something in between. When we dealt with a short, that only allowed me to have numbers between negative 32,000 and positive 32,000. But there are situations where maybe I don't care about negative numbers. Maybe the mere existence of negative numbers cuts my range in half. And so I can put a flag in front of my variable and say, hey, I'd like unsigned numbers. Notice unsigned is a reserved word here. So if I make this a unsigned short, save it, compile it, and run it. Now I want an unsigned short. I can actually go up to 60,000, and it doesn't have a problem. Remember that short had a range that was from negative 32,768 to positive 32,767. Now my range actually goes from 0 to 65,535. And so when I increment, I actually increment back to zero. So now I actually have a true odometer where it resets back at zero. I can do the exact same thing with an int. And what that allows me to do is it allows me to go up to uh, 4,294,967,295. And then my odometer goes back to zero. And of course, I could do the same thing with an unsigned long and deal with 18 quintillion, but you know that's something I don't really need to show. So what this does is this allows us to deal with integer values on a range that we need. So in other words, if I need an integer value in a very specified range, then we're okay. Uh, 
this allows me to have much more control over the memory. And remember I said C++ programs have a lot more control over memory, and we're going to be dealing a lot more with how to use memory efficiently and how to have time done efficiently. Notice, of course, these programs are a lot quicker to compile than our Java counterparts, and they're also quicker to run. So we've been dealing with whole number or integer values. So now I want to take this and I want to talk about uh, decimal values. And we are familiar with double from Java. Double stands for double precision, which means these are twice the precision of some unforeseen number that we never really talked about. So if I go ahead and r compile this and run this, keep in mind that I could do 0 0.0000000000001 and I lose some accuracy here. If I go to 0 0.0000001, I'm still going to lose that accuracy. Where's the point? Hmm, interesting. So double is supposed to give me double precision. For some reason, it's not. Let me go ahead and change this to num gets num plus 0 0.1, just to get a different value here. We'll save that. Say that we're looking for a double instead of an unsigned short. Compile and run. So if I do 0.5 and I hit enter, I'm going to get 0.5 and then 0.6. If I run it and I want to do 0 0.00001, then I get this 1 times 10 to the negative 5. That, remember, this is the scientific notation we were familiar with uh, back in Java. And so adding 0.1 gets me up to here. I can even do really, really, really small numbers if I physically type in the uh, the exponential notation. So I could do 2.2, excuse me, uh, I could do 2.2e negative 300. And so I actually get a very, very, very small number, 300 zeros followed by a 2.2 two in the decimal places. Of course, if I add 0.1 to it, I lose a lot of that precision and I just get 0.1. So this is our double precision, but this is actually twice as much memory as what we called a float. And we talked briefly about floats back in Java. A double is an 8-byte number. So in other words, it really stores that decimal in 64 decimal places. How it actually stores uh, decimals in memory is actually a video for another time. A float is half as big. A float is 4 bytes, or 32 bits. And what that means is that I lose the range that I have. If I go ahead and talk about this, let me go ahead and save this, compile it, and run, uh, and run. So if I do 1e to the 30th power, um, that's within the range. If I try and do 1e40, you'll notice that I have a maximum double size that I can deal with, and it's 3.4 times 10 to the 38, or 3, 3 followed by 38 zeros. So a really long range. If I were to change this back to a double, and run this again, then I could do 1e to the 100th power, and that's not a problem. I could do 1e to the 200th power. But if I tried to do something like 1e to the 400th power, I find out the top range of this is going to be 1 followed by 308 zeros. So a float is 4 bytes, a double is 8 bytes, and yes, there is a bigger component to the double. We actually call it a long double because we're not very original. So what a long double does is this is actually going to give me a 16-byte or 128-bit decimal. And so now if I try and run this, I'm going to have a much larger, excuse me, if I compile it and then run it, I'm going to have a much longer, longer range. So I could do 1 times 10 to the thousandth power, or I could do 1 times 10 to the two thousandth power. I can even do 1... 1 times 10 to the 4,000th power, 
and it has no problem with these values. If I try and go to 1e to the 5,000 power, then I find out the upper range of this is going to be 1.18 times 10 to the 4,932nd power. And I get quite a bit of decimal accuracy, even though I'm not seeing that decimal accuracy here. We'll talk later on about how to use printf to get much more accurate output. Right now, my output is pretty much stuck at a maximum of five decimal places. But I did want to talk about how I do have short, medium, and long integer values and short, medium, and long double values that all use varying amounts of memory because our memory requirements may be subject to some constraints. Imagine if you're programming for a phone or if you're programming for an embedded device. Memory is going to be at a premium in those situations and you definitely want to take care of that. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about just real quick, we do have chars. So I'm going to go ahead and keep it called num, just realize this is not a num, this is a char. And so if I run this program again, uh, if I compile and run this program again, and I type in a letter like A, then obviously adding 0.1 is not going to do anything. I want to add 1 to it, because a char technically is an integer type. It just has a much smaller range. So if I type in A, the successor to A is B. If I plus plus the Unicode value or the ASCII value, I'm going to get B. And if I do it again with a capital A, then I'm going to get capital B. If I do that with uh, 3 as the character 3, which has a Unicode value of 51, then it's going to increment it, and I'm going to get the next character, which is 4. If I try and do the same thing with 9, then I get the character that's next to 9, in the list of chars, and that ends up being the colon. And then finally, I've got boolean, which is just bool. We're familiar with bool from our C sharp work, but in Java we had the full boolean. So if I try and run this again, compiles. If I type in a zero, then of course the next one is one. If I type in a one, then the next one is one. In other words, incrementing a true doesn't make it false, it just makes it true. So I can try and decrement, see what happens. So we'll save this and compile and run. So now if I have a 1, decrementing a 1 takes me to 0 or false. If I run it again and give it a 0, decrementing a 0 gets me a 1. So some peculiar behavior when we increment and decrement with booleans, but notice that we're only allowed those values 0 and 1, and that's something to be interested in. I believe technically a boolean is a one-byte data, just because one byte is the smallest amount of data that can be assigned to a variable, um, but it's still only going to give us values of 0 and 1. So um, we've talked a little bit about the primitive types. We've talked about chars. We've talked about bools. We've talked about ints. We've talked about doubles. You'll notice that we left something out that we talked quite a bit about in Java. So we're going to have to see that later. We're going to be talking about strings later because they have some very interesting behavior. But that's going to be for another episode. Once again, this is Mr. Potter. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.